just reliving some moments. Whenever I hear little ones in the sanctuary, I always feel bad for the parents, but it brings so much joy to my heart. And, and I remember that feeling of like, I got to get this kid out of here. You know, like, and you have to like, they're going to disturb. I mean, God's not going to hear the prayers of my kids screaming. Um, but you know what? We welcome it. We're so thankful for it. I'm so thankful that there's little ones here. And I've been telling people this since the beginning of our church. We want to grow by the loss coming to know Jesus. And we also want to grow through healthy families naturally growing. You know, and just as the Lord blesses you guys, as he adds more children to this congregation, it's a beautiful thing. We love it. So um, don't be ashamed of it. This morning, um, if you're unfamiliar, my name is Mike. I'm one of the staff pastors. I get to open our time in the Word this morning um, by just reading a passage of Scripture, and then um, Todd is going to come up and teach today. And when he comes up, I want you guys to cheer like he, you know, like Rocky Balboa just knocked out Apollo Creed, okay? So, like, <laughs> very excited to have Todd. He's one of our elders here at Transform to, to share this morning. And so I get light duty. I just get to read the passage of Scripture, and he's going to come up and preach, and you're all going to be blown away. So here's no pressure. The passage he's asked me to read this morning is from Colossians chapter 1, beginning in verse 15. It says this, speaking of Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. Notice that, through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Oh, there, there I am. <laughs> well, good morning, guys. Um, like Mike was saying, my name is Todd Steele. Um, I'm one of the elders here at Transform. I'm not one of the regular teaching pastors, so if this is your first time or if you're just visiting, by the end, you're like, who is this clown? Uh, fair, but come back next week, and <laughs> we'll be back to your regularly scheduled uh, Mike Jacobs. <laughs> But we are going to continue through our study through the book of uh, Mark this morning. We're going to be wrapping up Mark chapter 4, so if you want to get out your Bibles and go ahead and turn to Mark chapter 4, we'll start in verse 35, which is Jesus calming the storm. It's a kind of a common passage I think we've heard. It's a popular like Sunday school um, lesson that circulates quite a lot. And what's unique about the way in which we've been going through Mark is Mike and BJ, as they've been taking us through, through it, um, they've been trying to leave out the details that we see in other Gospels. Uh, it's a very common thing if you've been coming to church for a while. Whenever you teach through a Gospel, generally where there's parallels, um, in, in the other three, pastors will, will compare and contrast those parallels. Um, in fact, I took a class once where I was instructed to do that. Um, but they haven't been doing that this time around. And the reason is not because that's a bad practice or we shouldn't do that. Um, the reason is because, as far as experts can tell, Mark is the first gospel that was written and recorded and released to the church. And so we have been trying to present Mark in a way that Mark, who is probably speaking on behalf of Peter, would have intended. And as you might notice, if you in your own studies are, are going and doing those comparisons on your own, we'll notice that the other Gospels will often hit details that Mark doesn't. Um, the idea behind Mark was it's, it's called the rapid-fire Gospel, you know. It's, uh, it was 
the idea is the church is young. There's people in Asia, in the south of Europe, all over the place that were not local to Judea who are becoming Christians and needed to know who Jesus was. So the thought was, let's make this, let's get this gospel out quickly. And I think a problem, when I hear the word quickly, uh, I often think haphazardly. Uh, like it was just kind of shotgun together, and there's not really a r- rhyme or reason to Mark or, or Peter's writing style. And experts don't think this, and I doubt that like anybody, um, if we honestly ask, do you think the Bible was just cobbled together would, would make that assertion? Um, but I think it's an easy presumption for us to make on our own, especially when we read something like Mark that's so, so rapid fire. Um, but Mark does have a style. It does have a rhythm and uh, an order to, to why he's, he's writing things the way he is. Um, so why is it presented this way? Um, because uniquely, and I say all this because the passage we're going to study today actually has more details than what we see in other Gospels. It's a little bit longer. It's a short passage, but it's still just a little bit details here and there that have been included. Um, The purpose of Mark's writing is to challenge us, the reader, with the idea of who Jesus is. Mark is saying, here's this man. He was named Jesus of Nazareth. He healed the sick and the lame. He cast out demons He had the authority to put the religious leaders in their place. And in this case, he calms the wind and the waves. Who do you think he is, dear reader? And what are you going to do with that information? It's like he's taking the story that we actually find in Mark 8, spoiler alert, where he's the disciples are sitting around a campfire with Jesus and he's asking who do people say that I am they say some say John the Baptist some say Elijah and then he asks them he says who do you say that I am and Peter answers the Messiah it's like he's kind of taken that and taken the meta narrative and blown it up and set us all around the campfire who do you say that Jesus is and again if you're a disciple of Christ um, if you count yourself a Christian I think we know the right answer, but do we believe that in our heart? Or are we like Peter, who can say the right answer, you're the Messiah, you're the anointed one, but then like immediately get it wrong, and then rebuke that Messiah and anointed one immediately after. So, as a reminder where we've been for the last couple weeks, Jesus has been teaching in a boat on the Sea of Galilee, teaching to on, onto the coast to a group of people. He's been sharing many of the common parables that we see, and then we're going to continue on from when he finishes the last parable in Mark chapter 4, verse 35, says, On that day, when evening had come, he told them, Let's cross over to the other side of the sea. So they left the crowd and took him along, since he was in the boat, and other boats were with him. A great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. So they woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? He got up, he rebuked the wind and the sea. Silence, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still not have faith? And they were terrified and asked one another, Who then is this? Even the wind and the sea obey him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you. I thank you for your word. I thank you for this passage. I thank you for the gospels that you presented for unique and yet um, matching accounts of who you are so that we may know you and learn from you and become more like you, Father. God, I pray for our time in the word this morning that um, your spirit would move, that nothing a human Um, desires would be made known, but only things that you desire would be made made known, Father. And Lord, I pray these things in your name. Amen. All right, so Jesus, he's been teaching all day. Um, It's headed towards the nighttime, so he tells the 12, hey, let's get out of here, let's go. I want to go to the other side uh, of the lake, which is the lake of the Sea of Galilee. Um, He's already on the boat, so they just take off. It records a couple details that there are other boats with him. Um, And just 
for, we're going to have a little bit of sizzle for our Israel trip this fall. Jonah, if you could go to that map up there. So here's a map of kind of the area where Jesus hung out. You'll see up in the north of it is the Sea of Galilee, um, which is where they were. And then you'll see a river that goes down and that flows into the Dead Sea, which that's the Jordan River. Um, the Sea of Galilee is the lowest freshwater lake on the planet Earth. The Dead Sea is the lowest saltwater lake on the planet Earth. Um, and I picked a topographical map because when I was looking at it last night, it was eight inches away from my monitor. Um, but you guys probably can't tell <laughs> that there's a, a ton of mountains around the Sea of Galilee. Super, super high mountains. And what would happen is winds would pass over the mountains and then just drop and rush into the sea, and you'd get these crazy, unexpected windstorms. Um, I actually I had a similar situation uh, a couple weeks ago. My, my regular job called me to Seattle for a couple days, and um, I was studying this in the hotel. And then on the way back, I was going through Snoqualmie Pass and just getting knocked around um, by the wind because there's... As you're driving through, if you've been to Seattle, you can see there's super high mountains on all sides. As wind passes over, it, it knocks you around. And I have a big, like, kind of a cargo van thing, so it's especially susceptible to big winds. And um, was not dangerous, but still was, was not fun to navigate, especially around the 18-wheelers. And this is a similar situation, except you're on a boat in the middle of the sea. And in this context, it's at night. So it's scary stuff. So I'm going to reread verse 37 and 38. So the great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking over the boat, so that the boat was already being swamped. He was in the stern, sleeping on the cushion. So they woke him up and said, Teacher, don't you care that we're going to die? So a storm hits. Um, looks like the boat's about to sink. And where's Jesus? He's asleep. And, in, in, and really, it would make sense that he would go to sleep during this trip because he's probably pretty tired. He's been teaching all day. This, like, and, and ask Mike and BJ, like, this standing up here presenting, is, it's a tiring affair. Just speaking, educating, reading people, it's, it, it's they've proven in science. It's, it, it makes you tired. Um, I'm... Back to my day job, I, I'm an appliance technician, so I go into people's homes, I work on refrigerators, washers, dryers, that sort of thing. And what I found in eight years of doing that job and what I think most people find when you work in other people's homes is oftentimes you don't have to fix the thing, you have to fix the person. <laughs> um, oftentimes... They're not using their washer right. They're not using their dishwasher correctly. Scrape your dishes. Don't rinse them. Sorry. <laughs> but, and, and you have to go through. You, you put the soap here. You do these settings. You don't um, put every comforter you own in the washing machine. Things like that. Um, and that is oftentimes more tiring and exhausting for me just talking to a person for an hour or two about how the machine works than just like, turning the machine over and replacing a part and being done with it. I can communicate with, and it's, it's kind of probably speaks to my fallen nature, that I can communicate with a washing machine a lot easier than I can with a person. <laughs> <laughs> but it is. It's tiring. So Jesus is tired. And Where am I? Okay. <laughs> it makes sense that he's tired because he's a man. He's fully man. But it also makes sense that he wouldn't be worried because he's fully God. So he can sleep. But I think we see that the revelation of what's inside the disciples' heart comes out here. When he says, teacher, don't you care we're going to die? Don't you care, God? Have you asked that? It's, it's okay to admit that you have because I've asked that. I've been in that place, and I think everybody has. is like, God, don't you care that the storm's all around me? Don't you care that everything is going crazy 
all over the place. Like you're literally for the the analogy is going to be a boat in a storm. Like you're in a tiny boat in a hurricane getting thrown around as the waves go higher than you could ever imagine, thought that they would go and then crash lower than you ever thought they would go. God, I thought you cared. And I'm sure we could all quote Matthew 6, which says, Consider the birds of the sky. They don't sow or weep or gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? Can any of you add one moment to his lifespan by worrying? And why do you worry about clothes? Observe how the wildflowers of the field grow. They don't labor or spin thread. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was adorned like one of these. If that's how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and thrown into the furnace tomorrow, won't he do much more for you? You have little faith. This is something we know, church. Like, this is something I think many of us could quote. Um, If you were here with us a couple years ago, we went through the Sermon on the Mount. Um, This is just very common to us. But is it in our hearts? When we're actually in that place, when we don't know where our food or where our clothes are going to come, do we actually say, hey, God takes care of the birds of the air and the lilies of the field. He's going to take care of me. Um, Or do we start panicking? And on a secondary note, how easy is it for us to toss out those verses when it's somebody else going through a storm and it's not us? It may seem like he doesn't care sometimes. It may seem like he's not listening. But he does, because look what happens next. In verse 39, he got up, rebuked the wind, and said to the sea, Silence, be still. The wind ceased, and there is great calm. So first off, he gets up. Notice there's a storm going on around him. There's probably thunder. Wind is probably super loud. There's waves going all over the place. He's probably wet. That doesn't wake him up. What wakes him up is his disciples crying out to him. What wakes him up is the, the call to need. Um, I'm about to embarrass my wife now. <laughs> um, she's a pretty heavy sleeper. Um, I'm a snorer, so she has to be. Um, I'm a big fella. If other big guys, you know, we snore, we're loud. So to, to cope, I, I don't think she started out as much of a heavy sleeper, but after 10 years of, like, coping with the Harley Davidson that is in the back of my throat, she's become a pretty heavy sleeper. But we have a three-month-old now that sleeps next to her. That baby peeps, and she's up. She's attentive. She cares. This is our fourth. And for every one of our kids, whenever there's been a need, she could be dead to the world. The second a sound comes out, she is up and caring, and I'm not snoring because I'm pretending to be asleep, but... (laughs) (laughs) she knows the call of her children and and our heavenly father knows the call of his children so but here's here's kind of a problem with an application we get out of this text that we hear come up often it actually caused me to throw out a lot of my commentators that I have a lot of respect for because they kind of went this direction, Um, is that they'll say the application for this text is that Jesus wants to quiet the storms of your life. You just have to have faith. And now Jesus can quiet whatever storm that he wants, and we should have the faith that he can do it if he wants to. If it's his will, that's not always his will. He quieted this storm... But he doesn't quiet every storm. I think Paul puts it best in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, in verse 7. It says, So that I would not exalt myself, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of the Satan, to torment me so that I would not exalt myself. Concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that he would leave me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. My power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness, so that Christ's power may reside in me, so that I take pleasure in weakness, insults, hardship, persecutions, and in difficulties for the sake of Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Amen? Amen. I love that passage. 
God makes his power known in our weakness. And sometimes, like the disciples in the boat, he does that by calming the storm. But sometimes, like Paul, he doesn't. He lets the storm linger. And either way, it is for, it's not for us to decide. It is for him to decide and for us to respond in faithfulness and obedience. For Romans chapter 8 says that we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Is the Lord's will that decides whether or not to calm our storms. It is our job to have faith. And really, he's going to get us through the end no matter what. Because if there's a storm in your life, it's the worst that can happen to you. It can kill you. <laughs> but in the end, absent from the body is presence with the Lord, right? So in the end, if there's something in our life that won't go away and it is the end, then it's about finishing the race well. And it's about enjoying the new resurrection with him. So verse 40 then says, Jesus responded to them. He said to them, why are you afraid? Do you still not have faith? Um, parents, do you ever talk to your kids about something? And then they immediately do something that implies that they weren't listening at all. Um, it's like we just talked about this. Like I said, I have four kids. Um... And I think this is kind of harder on my wife and I because my wife was an only child her whole life. I didn't have any siblings until I was 16 years old. So, like, we didn't grow up with the sibling rivalry thing. We kind of just got to sit wherever in the car we wanted. We didn't have to share our toys. It was sweet. But now that we have four kids and two of them share a room, it is chaos. And we'll go through and we'll be like, you have to work on these. You have to share. You have to take turns. Try it this way. Do this. Like, Today he can sit there, then you can sit there, da, 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 da. And we have these conversations, and then 20 minutes pass, and they're like hopping back into the octagon. Like, <laughs> like, and I have to imagine that minus the sin that's in my heart, that's how Jesus feels here. They just talked about this. Remember, this is on the same day that Jesus is sharing these parables. So um, since we're already there, if you can hop back up in your Bibles to Mark 4.30 is the parable of the mustard seed. And it said, with what can we compare the kingdom of God? Or what parable can we use to describe it? It's like a mustard seed that when sown upon the soil is the smallest of all seeds on the ground. When sown, it comes up and grows taller than all the garden plants and produces large branches so that the birds of the sky nest in the shade. This boat, with 11 out of those 12 guys and Jesus, is the mustard seed. It is this tiny little group of humans that Jesus is going to use to start the church. A church that will turn the planet upside down. In this day, in the first century, um, the average Roman denarius, which was their, um, like their coin, their denomination, it featured the face of Caesar on it. By the fourth century, just a couple centuries later, it would feature a cross and other Christian symbols. That means just a couple hundred years, society, on large, not everybody, not 100%, obviously, went from saying that Caesar is Lord to Jesus is Lord. And this is the group of humans Jesus is going to use to start that, to create this huge tree out of this tiny little seed. So, of course, they were going to survive their their trip across the lake. Of course they were going to survive the storm. Of course Jesus was going to save them. Because the church is the mechanism in which God has chosen to bring the hope of Jesus into the world. And no storm is going to overtake that. Even if it overtakes us individually. Because those guys, all but one of them got martyred. <laughs> the storms of their life eventually overtook them. But the hope of Jesus that they left lingered. And the hope of Jesus that we leave will linger. Well, the disciples are surprised at least. In verse 41, they were terrified, and they asked one another, who then is this? Even the wind and the seas obey them. So here in verse 41, the Greek word that they use for terrified implies a fear that comes with reverence. It's the idea that um, you're scared of this person, but you have deep respect for them. And it makes sense 
when you consider what they're saying, that even the wind and the sea obey him. This is calling out to a very specific Old Testament motif. Um, in Jonah, there's just like a list of, of four verses there. Um, this is a very specific Old Testament motif that is used throughout there, not just these four verses, but I'll read these four. So Psalm 89, 9 says, You rule the raging sea, speaking of the Lord. When its waves surge, you still them. Psalm 65, 7, You silence the roar of the seas, the roar of their waves, and the tumult of the nations. Psalm 107, 25, He spoke and raised the stormy wind that stirred up the waves of the sea, rising up to the sky, sinking down to the depths, their courage melting away in anguish. They reeled and staggered like a drunkard and all their skill was not useless. Then they cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he brought them out to their distress. He stilled the storm to a whisper, and the waves of the sea were hushed. And then in Job 38, 8 and 11, 8 through 11 this is God speaking. Who enclosed the sea behind the doors when it burst from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and total darkness its blanket, when I determined its boundaries and put its bars and doors in place, when I declared... You may come this far, but no farther. Your proud waves stop here. Those are but a few of the scriptures that would come to the disciples' mind at this moment. So here they're having a re-realization about who Jesus is. They've already, we haven't hit Mark 8 yet, but they've already seen him forgive sins. Like they have an idea that this is the Messiah at least. Um... But they have a re-realization that this is the one who rules over the wind and the seas. This is the one who crushes Egypt and other nations, who splits the Red Sea, who gave Moses the law, who used David to crush their enemies, who sent their prophets to speak his will. This is Yahweh in the boat with them. This is the God of the heavens sitting here with this boat with us. With them. So my question for you guys and, and for myself, do we know who is it that's in this boat with us? I know, like I've been talking about, we can all, you know, we can all regurgitate the right answer, right? But when we're in a storm, when things are going, are being difficult for us, when the pressure is on, who is it that you call out to? Or is it, God, are you listening do you care? Maybe that's the spot that you're in right now. So how do we go from God, do you care, to faith that he does care whether he pulls us from the storm or not? I think we see a few examples in Scripture. First, in the Old Testament, so we know that the disciples are without excuse. Um, in Daniel 3, uh, we all know that story, Radshak, Meshach, Abednego. They, they're Jewish men that have been carried off to the... To, Babylon. Um, Nebuchadnezzar raises a golden statue in his own honor and says, hey, whenever music plays, you better bow to me. And sure enough, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego don't. They worship the Lord. So they're arrested. They're brought before Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar likes these guys so that he's like, hey, I'll give you guys one more chance. When music hits, if you want to bow down to the statue now, we're good. Otherwise, I'm going to throw you in the fire. And this is how they respond. In Daniel 3, 17, if the God we serve exists, then he can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he can rescue us from the power of you, the king. But even if he does not rescue us, we want you as king to know that we will not serve your gods or worship the gold statue you set up. We will not budge whether he saves us or not. Lord, I know you can rescue me. I want you to rescue me. I know you can bring me out of this. But even if you don't, I will still praise you. I will still serve you. The second is in the New Testament. Um, this is before the disciples haven't hit this point yet, so I guess they have an excuse here. But the second is in the New Testament with Jesus in the garden before he's about to be arrested. He's sweating great drops of blood, the scripture says, which we know is a scientific thing that can happen. You can be so stressed and so in anguish that the blood vessels underneath your skin can burst and you will, and you will sweat blood. And in that point, in the most distress he's ever been, 
Jesus says, Father, if you are willing, take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. Then an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. For the first time in history, in the history of the cosmos, the will of God the Father and the will of God the Son were out of alignment, and God the Father, excuse me, God the Son said, not my will, but yours. And he went to the cross, he was tortured, he was humiliated, he died a death that he did not have to die for the sake of us. And then he tells us to live like that, to follow him, to, to say, not my will, Father, your will. Because perfect relationship with him is so much richer and beautiful than anything we can gain by avoiding the pain in this life. Um, worship team, you can come up. Maybe, maybe you are in a storm. If not now, you will be soon. That's a promise we get from the Lord is that there will be trials, there will be difficulties. Maybe all you can think is and pray is, God, where are you? Don't you care? Are you listening? Or maybe you don't think that at all. Maybe you just go through life and you bare knuckle it and and you know, you, you don't ask if God's there or not, but you don't do anything at all. You don't pray at all. You just go into robot mode and try to do it yourself. You're not telling God that he doesn't care, but you're really not saying anything at all. My prayer is for us today that when storms come to our life, when we have no idea what's going on, when we think we're going to die, we say, not my will, but yours, Father. And if we can't, then we're like the demon who casts or not like the demon. <laughs> We're like the father who had a demon-possessed son. He was asking Jesus to cast him out. And he said to him, I do believe, help my unbelief. If you're not at not my will, but yours will, be there. I do believe, help my unbelief. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you're in control no matter what this life brings us, Father. God, I pray that we would look to you in every season, Lord, in storms and in daylight, Father. I pray we would pray that we would continue to praise you, we would love you, we would worship you, regardless of anything that came our way. I pray all these things in your name. Amen.